As I begin today, I would like to turn uh, to 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. One of those key scriptures we look at at this time of the year, and we reflect on this a lot. And in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, uh, Paul is talking to or writing to the church at Corinth. Now, the church at Corinth was a Gentile church, and they didn't have a lot of the knowledge and understanding that the Jews had. Uh, about uh, the keeping of the Passover and about the history of the children of Israel and their keeping of the, the uh, Passover, how it was established, how the uh, firstborn of Egypt were killed and how those who painted their doorposts and the lentils of their houses with the blood of a lamb were passed over. So he's addressing this church. And down in uh, verse 20, and that's where we're going to start. Uh, it says, But now indeed there are many members, 1 Corinthians oops, 11, not 12, 1 Corinthians 11 and uh, verse 20. It says, Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, he says, you, when you come, it's not for eating the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. You're thinking of yourself. And one is hungry and another is drunk. Let's see. Now, we're coming to celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. And this is how you're treated. It says, somebody's hungry and they're wanting to gobble stuff up. And somebody's coming in drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? You're thinking of yourself. You're only thinking of your pleasure. You're only. This is not what the Passover was about. You Corinthians, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Let's jump down to... Uh, uh, Verse uh, 23, go next to uh, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. And then he goes through what he received and the way that you're supposed to keep the Passover. Verse 27. Then he says, he's talking about uh, taking the cup of the new covenant and uh, taking the bread that represents the, uh, the, the body of Christ. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. What do we mean? Guilty. It's as though... If you're not doing this in the right way, with the right attitude, it is as though you are in an unforgiven manner found guilty of this crime. But let a man take a look at yourself. Take a look at what a crud you really are. Take a look at what motivates you. Take a look at what... Uh, you're actually acting out in your life and examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You know, take this meal, take this meal of the blood of Jesus Christ and the body of Jesus Christ. For he 
who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment. Verse 29. Judgment. Judgment. Uh, the King James Version says uh, eats and drinks damnation to himself. And that's from the uh, Greek uh, uh, Strong's number G2917 Crema. And it means a, uh, a legal decision against you. To where you are in court before the judge and the judge passes a sentence and says, this is my judgment. You know, they're going to take you out and you will be hanged by the neck until you are dead. You, uh, a judgment is rendered. Not discerning the Lord's body. Now I want to stop right at that point because what does it mean? Not discerning the Lord's, what do you mean discerning the Lord's body? What is there to discern about the Lord's body? Let's jump to uh, to Verse 30. For this reason, because you haven't discerned the Lord's body, for this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many are dead. They sleep. Uh, it says the dead know nothing. They sleep. And it's all it's like. They've gone to sleep and they'll wake up later when God calls them back. But because you're not discerning the Lord's body, you're sick and many sleep. Well, guess what? That could describe the church of God today, right? Look, look on our look on our list here. And so today I'd like to discuss a little bit this concept of discerning the Lord's body. We have a big packet of prayer requests. Since that prayer request came out, that packet is more than just the ones we have on our weekly bulletin. Since that prayer request came out, uh, Mr. Rick Bean passed away. Here we are relying on the body of Christ. And the body of Christ, the sacrifice of the body of Christ relates to healing, doesn't it? That's what we're uh, relying on for healing. And yet here we are getting sick. I'm getting sick. Many of you are getting sick. The whole world's getting sick. And the whole world's getting sicker and sicker in many different ways. What is it that we're not discerning? And are we getting it right? Or are we failing to discern the body of Christ, and as a result of that, are we getting sick and some of us are dying? So what does the body of Christ do for us? What is there to discern? We know about the association between Christ's blood and our salvation, right? Right? Jesus Christ died. That blood covers our sins, hides them in a way, hides them from God the Father. And God the Father sees that puddle of our sins covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. And God the Father can say, I don't see anything there. I don't see any sin. Uh, I don't see any sin for this person, so they're blameless. 
And God created this sacrifice for that purpose so that we can be found to be blameless, so that we can be given the Holy Spirit of the Father, so that we can make changes in our lives with the power and the strength of that Spirit, so that blood can bring us the hope of salvation. But what does the Lord's body do for us? What is there to discern? Turn to 1 Peter. First Peter, the second chapter. I'd like to look at uh, verse 24. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, uh, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sin, might live for righteousness. We have a hope to live for righteousness. It says, and then it goes on, there's a dash there in the New King James Version. It says, by whose stripes you were healed. And so, a particular reason that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ's body was made is so that our hurts, our uh, wounds, our, uh, in the child's parlance, our boo-boos are healed over. And so that is actually a paraphrase of another scripture going to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, Isaiah 53, and let's uh, look at, at verse 4. Isaiah 53, verse 4. It says, He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, our transgressions. And he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was on him. And by his stripes, we are healed. He did that. For a purpose. He did that so that those uh, diseases, as it were, would be taken away. So there's a connection relating to our attitude or discerning the body of Christ with the healing that takes place. And for the reason that Jesus Christ went through uh, those beatings. Now, in Exodus, the 15th chapter, Exodus 15, and I'm going to read uh, verse 26. And it says here in Exodus 15, 26, and this is, uh, Jesus Christ uh, giving a message to Israel. Uh, I'll, I'll read uh, the last part of 25 as well to complete the paragraph. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you 
which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. There's a big caveat there. It says if. If. And so when we see diseases in our midst, when we see uh, that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is made for our healing, and yet we see diseases and we see death, is it not appropriate for us to examine ourselves and our attitudes about that healing and about that sacrifice? None of the diseases. These, those are the ones that we get if we don't obey, right? The Egyptian diseases. Carry forward to now. Do we take that sacrifice, and I'm asking this as a question, as a part of this idea of examining ourselves, are we taking that sacrifice casually? Next, let's go to James, the fifth chapter, because we have instructions from the apostles, from the apostle James. Instructions on what to do, and we have read this many times. James 5, 14. Is there anyone among you sick? Is there anyone here who is sick? Is there anyone here in this room who has some malady that we have asked God to take away? Or that we would like God to take away? And I already know the answer because the answer is yes from every one of us. There are things that we would like for God to take away. Paul wanted his eyesight back. Ask three times that his eyesight be restored. And it was partially restored. And partially not. So let's examine a little bit why that might be. Now, some people come and ask for anointing. Some people don't. Uh, why would you not? Is there some sort of negative expectation with regard to that that would prevent someone? Uh, a lot of times I hear, well, I, I, I don't want to bother somebody for something that's simple. Um, if, it's, it, if it's a physical problem, why would you not take advantage of what God said? But you have to do it with the right idea and the right attitude as well. So is there some sort of negative expectation or is there a disbelief? In Mark, the ninth chapter in verse 23, won't go there. There was, uh, well, I, I think maybe we, we will. Mark 9, verse 23. Because if there is a disbelief involved, then that's a problem, uh, is it not? Mark 9, verse 23. And this is uh, a, a man who's come and asking for healing for his, uh, for his son. And uh, so he's asked, so he asked the father, this is Jesus Christ, how long has this been happening to him? He said, from childhood. It's been, it's been this way all of his life. 
And he says, but if you, and the, this is the end of verse 22, but if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. He has the want. He has the, the desire to see his son healed. If you can do anything, have compassion on, uh, uh, on us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe. So sometimes a weakness in belief can stand between us and the application of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on our behalf. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears. So this is a sincere statement. Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. So he said, I believe, but I waver. Sometimes I have doubts. It's interesting, James talks about the man who has doubts. It's like the waves of an ocean that comes and it goes. It, it goes up on the shore and it recedes back away. Sometimes our belief can waver. And yet, God can help us with that as well. Back in uh, uh, James, uh, we're back in, uh, in in James again, James, the fifth chapter. I'm sorry, I should have told you to keep your finger there. but And so it says, if anyone among you, is anyone among you, sit, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord for the prescription of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins he will be forgiven. Well that's pretty uh That's pretty all-inclusive in all circumstances and situations. Now, it has been suggested by some that if you are not healed, and not healed is, divide, is uh, uh, defined by <clears throat> all of my symptoms are gone. Every, it's like I've got a perfect body again. All my symptoms are gone. Um, and, you know, my body's functioning just like it was when ever. That if you're not healed, it's because you just don't have enough faith. Now, that's not a very nice thing to say to somebody. And I had someone talking to me here recently and his wife was sick, and somebody suggested to her that very thing. He said, well, if you just have more faith. And so that's sort of a judgmental thing, isn't it? It says, I have determined in my righteousness that you don't have enough faith. And so because of that, in my righteousness, I'm making the judgment that, um, that that's the reason you're not healed. And then you become a judge, right? James 4, 11, just back one chapter. James 4, 11. Uh, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you are a judge of the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. You're being a judge. And it's not appropriate for us to judge our brothers. And whether they are sinners, that's what we all are. We all are. Now some are not and, and, and again, the way we define it is if the symptoms go away. 
Some don't have our symptoms go away for very specific reasons. In John, the ninth chapter, in uh, verse 3, is one of those situations. And Jesus was being asked uh, uh, about a man who uh, was a man, had been blind all of his life. And in uh, John 9, it says in verse 1, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Oh, somebody did something wrong. Somebody really went off the rail here. Says, Rabbi, who sinned? Because we know that uh, uh, these difficulties can only come on you because you've done something really bad. You really made God mad. Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Couldn't have been for any other reason, right? And Jesus answered, and it's Interesting. I mean, Jesus knew this man and knew of this man. This man, not just some, you know, random man that I know nothing about, but Jesus knew this man because he knew his parents and him. Neither this man nor his parents sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Jesus is telling them there was a plan in motion at least from the time that this man was born and when he was conceived that this man would be blind on this day. And so he has gotten no relief all of his life. But to be blind on this day. It says, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. It's so that it could point to Jesus Christ and begin the process of building a reputation about the Savior of the world, that this man's healing was postponed until this time. Sometimes it's God's purpose to do what God wants to work out his plan. Second Corinthians, the 12th chapter, there's a, we're not too far away from 1 Corinthians 11, in case we need to go back there, right? Second Corinthians 12, let's look at uh, verse 9. And this is where uh, Paul was worried about his eyesight and this uh, problem that he had and we'll actually start reading in verse 7 but uh, Paul requested that his blindness be taken away or his problems be taken away three times he requested it verse 7 and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation a thorn in the flesh was given to me we presume it to be the eyesight thing a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now, read through the writings of Paul. He is an absolutely amazing writer of things of the faith that God gave him. On the one occasion, he says, I am a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I am a gung-ho Pharisee, and I go for it, and I'm successful. When I go out to kill Christians, I kill Christians. When I go out to preach of the kingdom of God, I preach the kingdom of God. 
and I am successful at doing it. God works amazing things, but if you want to ruin a man, give him success. And so much of the time, that will ruin an individual. It says, success begets success, but if you have so much success that you begin to thinking about how great you are, then you have destroyed the man. Because humility before God is absolutely necessary. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations that a thorn was given to him. Verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. For you to be humble before me is a lot more important and important to me and the work of God than your ability to preach your ability to convince, your ability to write. Sometimes we need these things as a reminder. And so we can wonder, why am I not being healed? Why aren't the symptoms going away? But notice in James, he said that it was a promise for the healing and that he would raise them up. Raise them up. Sometimes the removal of the symptoms come at the resurrection of the dead when the first fruit rise up out of that grave. It's any consolation to us if that's what we are faced with, brethren. We we got to come up first. <laughs> you know? And all of those who are standing there are going to be jumping to see us rise and wanting to be with us and trying to do those little hops to catch up with us, you know? But God has enough power to see us all raised from the dead. And so we see that there is a connection between that body of Christ and we're discerning that body of Christ. Just as Christ's blood ameliorates for our sinfulness, Christ's broken body attenuates our brokenness. And Healing is at God's time and God's choosing. That's, it's a, there's a tendency to lay an obligation on God. Well, God, you gave us James 5.14. And look, look, I called for the elders. I did one. I did number two. I did number three. Uh, all right, now do your part. Now, now heal me. So you have this obligation. I did my part. But it's always interesting. Hebrews 9.27, and I'm not going to turn there, but it says it's appointed to everybody to die. Now, if all I had to do was go to the elder, here I'm 98 years old, and I've got every disease known to man. And I've seen this. I have seen this in the hospital. An old gentleman. He was, I think, 93 or 94. And they were Pentecostals. The, the room was packed. That's one thing about Eastern Kentucky. A hospital is a form of entertainment in Eastern Kentucky. He said, all right, Mabel, what are we going to do after church today? Well, let's all pack up and go see Cousin George down in the E&R. They just took him down there. 
when they get there in the room, there, there'd be eight or 10 people packed in the room. And they're having this conversation. And says now, now we're not gonna we're we're not gonna let Cousin George die. We're not gonna let him die. We're gonna pray up the Holy Spirit, and we're gonna if we can just get him back out on the tractor, uh, back up in the in the back forty over there, he he'll be just fine. It is appointed for all of us to die. I don't care if you live the most healthful life that there is. The day of your death is coming. The day of my death is coming. There's no guarantee of life in the flesh without interruption. The most important thing to God is not our physical life. The most important thing to God is what is good. It's like Mr. Whitlark's um, talking about children not understanding the rules, not understanding the purpose. The parents have a purpose. The children don't understand the purpose. But we have to come to understand the purpose. God's purpose is to see us as children in his kingdom, not to see us live that perfect life. And so in discerning the body of Christ, we understand that healing does come from it. But it's not always how we want it. It's God's purpose and it's God's timing. Let's look at 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. Well, we are there. Uh, 12th verse, uh, very nearly at least. Oh, no, no, that, that was the one about uh, Paul. I'm sorry. Uh, and so what other reason would there be to... Uh, to uh, for God to delay in healing. Let's turn to Isaiah 57th chapter. I think of some of the ones who have died in our midst here recently. Isaiah 57. In verse 1, it says, The righteous perishes, and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. He shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. Sometimes God takes a person and lays them down for sleep for a merciful reason. Brethren, we live in a time when untold in our in this room and among our children almost for sure. They're going to see times of unparalleled evil. And some people just can't face that. And it would not be good for them to face that. And beyond that, there's Psalms 116. Psalms 116. 
in this page that won't open up here. Well, I was going to have to do that old lick your fingers thing. Uh, Psalm 116, verse, uh, verse 15. It is just uh, a, a stated given here that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Now, who could be happy at death? We are never happy at death because death is our enemy. Death is our enemy. Death is not God's enemy. It's not God's enemy. He is the master of life and death. And so it doesn't bother him other than the anguish that he sees in our loved ones and that type of thing. It's, it, it doesn't give God the same anguish to see our death because at that point, what is it? They made it. They made it. They are as good as in the kingdom and as soon as the Father gives me the word, they're out of that grave. And they are in the kingdom of God. They are, that's what is, they are made in the shade, as the old saying goes. And so we might get offended at the suggestion that, uh, that we just don't have enough faith and that. Uh, uh, in fact, it could be true. <laughs> Maybe we really don't. So we need to think about that, right? And notice that in James, the fifth chapter, in verse 15, it says, if you have sinned, if you have, if you've done the things that you oughtn't do, then you'll be forgiven brought about by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You know, and I'm going to have to move forward here because I'm going to be running out of time here very, uh, very quickly. The, the, the thing is, in Leviticus, the fourth chapter, Leviticus, the fifth chapter, and in, the, in, in Numbers, it talks about and Leviticus 4 is the law of the sin offering, by the way. The Leviticus 5 is the law of the trespass offering. And it also talks in numbers about unintentional sins. Oh, I didn't know. When you look at unintentional sins, guess what? God doesn't say, well, they're not really sins because you didn't know. You didn't, you didn't mean to. Now, how many times your kids say, well, yeah, yeah, I did that, but, uh, but I didn't mean it to turn out. I, you know, I didn't go to do it. I remember my uh, grandparents used to use that term. Uh, well, they didn't go to do it. You know, it wasn't intention. But God required a sacrifice for unintentional sins. And in James 5th chapter, verse 15, it says that that forgiveness will be made. Well, sometimes we bring our sicknesses on ourselves. And I brought all the rest of this uh, stuff up here because we live in a society we live in a society that suffers from Israelite diseases what I mean by Israelite diseases diseases of affluence it's just a part of who we are the Israelites those sins of Egypt are still with us today because we're not a different people than our forefathers were. They were rebellious. Guess what? The United States of America is a rebellious bunch of people. Katrina? 
robbing the stores, in any kind of cataclysm that goes on in this country, you got people out there, gangs and hooligans out there, breaking windows out of stores and robbing. We're the same bunch of people. We haven't changed. And we don't follow God's laws of eating. There is a, we hurt ourselves. We are the authors of our own demise. As one person put it, uh, we eat our debts because of the diet that we consume. Here is a uh, special health report put out by Harvard Medical School in 2020, which uh, I thought it was uh, curious. 58, uh, I'm sorry, 53 pages from Harvard Medical School costs only $29. Uh, I thought it was pretty high for 53 pages, uh, but they're recouping their costs. It is a glamorous, uh, glamorous book, slick paper, uh, but it has a lot of good information. It is fighting inflation, uh, I keep saying, it. fighting inflammation, how to stop the damage before it compromises your health. Well, guess what? In the United States of America, the damage is already done. We live in a sick society. We live in a society whose health is already compromised. You know, and they know, they know what causes the diseases that plague us the most. Heart disease will kill 40% of us, and it has been the number one killer for almost 100 years. You have this, uh, the statement, the American game. What is the American game? Anybody? The American game. The American game. Baseball. What is the American dessert? Apple pie, right. Absolutely. And what is the American disease? Heart disease. Heart disease. Interesting, Korean, right after the Korean War, uh, there was a scientific study that was reported in the Journal of American Medical Association. It was a post-mortem investigation of soldiers who were killed in action in the Korean War. Average age, 22. 22. 77%, and these were all young, fit, strong, prime examples of American manhood. 77% at 22 years old had a gross evidence of heart disease already. It is uh, what our diet. Now, when I was growing up, at my grandmother's table, there were biscuits and gravy. There were, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, it, it could have been sausage gravy, but if there wasn't sausage gravy, well, then there was Joel Baker on the table. And there were eggs fried to order. There were fried apples or canned blackberries. Uh, you name it, whatever Cracker Barrel has that can be ordered was on my grandmother's table when I grew up. And I ate it all. <laughs> and I usually cleaned the bowls. I was a voracious eater of the all-American breakfast. And lunch. Or we called it dinner. And supper. My grandmother cooked like that 
all the time. And I loved it. And I had my first heart attack at age 40. A victim of the all-American breakfast and way to eat. They have shown that inflammation, not that other in words, so <laughs> <laughs> but inflammation is directly and indirectly responsible for most autoimmune diseases, most allergic responses, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and type 1 diabetes. And of course, the inflammation of the heart and the blood vessels, which cause plaque to uh, collect big floods of cholesterol, and sometimes they rupture and the inflammatory process that results from that rupture plugs off that vessel entirely and kills you in stroke and brain fog and dementia and Alzheimer's disease and depression. They have shown that inflammation is a major producer of depression. Type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is, is, I've said in my career that if we could cure type 2 diabetes, we could shut down two-thirds of the hospitals in this country because of the, uh, the direct and the secondary effects of diabetes. When you get cellulitis, and then the cellulitis gets so bad that it turns into weeping cellulitis. And then your toes begin to rot and they start chopping your toes off. And then your foot and then your leg above the knee. And they pair away at you until you have no quality of life left. Your pancreas, where your insulin comes from, suddenly can't keep up, and so it goes into hyperproduction and to try to keep your uh, blood sugar levels right. Can't do it, and it wears out. And so then you have to take it through a needle. And then there's cancer. This is the American way. This is what we do when we disregard the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. Because we ignore the reason we're sick. Inflammation. There's another study done called the China study. And this was led by a PhD professor from Cornell University that went 28 years. And what he attempted to do, what he did, was study regions where the great American diet wasn't practiced. And what was their health? And they didn't have heart disease and they didn't have cancer. Now they had other things related to poverty, but our diseases are related to wealth wealth. We are wealthy. We can afford things that they can't afford, and so they don't die of the things that we die of. You know, they fall off rocks. They, uh, they have pneumonia. They have parasites. They have their own things that they have to deal with, but they don't die of the same things that we die of. Uh, it, it's interesting that uh, Heart disease is number one for us. Um, strokes is number four. Guess what number three is? 
No, I didn't mention number two either, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I was more interested in, in uh, number three because number three is uh, medical care. Medical care is the third most prominent cause of death in the United States. I, I thought that was uh, a, a very interesting statistic. Medical care uh, from improper uh, medications, uh, uh, unnecessary surgeries, uh, being treated by a doctor is a dangerous thing, and yet we all do it. Well, Dr. Campbell, in his conclusion, determined that eating animal protein is one of the reasons for the diseases of the American people. And he is a radical advocate of um, plant-based whole food diet. In other words, being a vegetarian and by dropping your animal protein to almost nothing and your protein down to about 10 to 15% of your diet, you can actually reverse some of these diseases. And they've been pretty conclusive about showing that. Except, guess what? I, I, I looked at that and I said, nobody's going to pay attention to it. Because I ate my grandmother's breakfast. I loved eating my grandmother's breakfast. And the congressman who write the laws, loved eating their grandmother's breakfasts too. And so when this study came before Congress and the powers that be funded this research for 28 years, 28 years until the final report came and they said, hmm, we can't do that. And there's a couple of reasons why we can't do that because Number one, we've eaten this way all of our lives and we can't believe it. Number two, the lobbyist from the Beef Producers Association and from General Foods and the big purveyors of food to Americans say, we'll lose our shirts if everybody goes to a plant-based diet. So we don't want you to push that. And so funding dollars dried up precipitously. So we're not going to, we're not going to fund this anymore. We don't want any more of that truth. And so uh, they are uh, not as uh, adamant about that these days, but the word gets out and the practitioners say, and my practitioner says, one piece of red meat a week. Now I got to thinking, it says, well, well, God is not a vegetarian. We can prove that. So how should we eat? How should we, because if we are not following the rules. If we're making Jesus Christ give up this sacrifice and we're doing things deliberately that hurt ourselves, is that not tempting God? We should not be tempting God, so we should not be deliberately doing things that we know is bad for us. if we want to rely on the healing that has been uh, given and promised. And so how did, how did the people in Jesus, in Jesus' day, 
How did they, what did they eat? Number one, every one of the sacrifices that God prescribed involved sacrificing and in most of the cases, eating meat. It was like, this is the meal with God. If I bring a uh, free will offering to God, guess what? The person that brought it got to help eat it. It's only in the sin offering and trespass offering they did not. But in most of these, the meat offering, the grain offering, uh, the drink offering, there were certain parts that went to the God, there were certain parts that went to the priest. But guess what? It was party day. When else did God prescribe to eat meat? On the holy days. There were holy day offerings. They were, these were days of sumptuous feasting. Savory offerings, God calls it. God loves the smell of roasting meat. What about the fatted calf? Abraham had a fatted calf. When, when the Lord came with the angels and they were going to check out Sodom and Gomorrah, they went past Abraham's tent. Abraham went out and killed the fatted calf. Interesting, the fatted calf. It's, uh, and meat was not normally eaten at that time. It was mostly grains and vegetables. It was almost a, to a total bit of the diet. Three measures of, 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 uh, of grain, by the way, that Sarah made into bread made 36 one-pound loaves of bread. This was not a daily meal. This was likely a meal in which every member of Abraham's Abrams at that time household ate with the Lord and with the angels. It says that the calf was uh, was a protected animal like a child. That calf was set aside. It was grain fed. It was beef beef and where the uh, and and there we're talking about Genesis 18 verse 6 where all this is laid out it says it was tender and the word there uh, for tender means weak or soft in other words it was kept to where it didn't run it didn't have hard muscles it uh, it stood there and it, and it got fat and it says that it was good, the Hebrew word tob, which means it was the best, the best. And so this was a sumptuous feast, not a snack for the road. Prodigal son, same thing, same thing. It was for a celebration beyond all celebrations, and it was to be, it said that the calf that the prodigal father served would have been sufficient to feed the entire village. God is not a vegetarian. He does not espouse us to take up a vegetarian diet. But, but, we have eaten till we're sick. The Israelites ate until they were sick. They demanded meat. They demanded quail. And God gave it to them till it came out their noses. What did they eat? Most common produce. Lettuce, cucumbers, garlic, herbs, spices. This is at the time of Christ. 
fruits were apricots, figs, melons, olives and olive oil, nuts and dates. The meat was only eaten on holy days and celebratory meals only and as offerings consisted of goat, lamb, small fowl, including pigeons and doves, fish, if you were in a, a fish producing area, Sea of Galilee, Jesus Christ fed two multitudes with fish and bread, beef and game, dairy, cheese that was more like cottage cheese, yogurt, and butter, which was rarely ever eaten. Eggs were almost never eaten at the time of Christ. Grain and bread. With the grains, they made porridges, stews, and salads. And the bread, it says, every person, every meal, every day. Bread consisted of 70% of the diet at that time. That's why Jesus said in John, the sixth chapter in verse 35, 48 and 51, that he was the bread of life. And that resonated to them because bread was the, such a major part of their diet that if you were out of bread, you were out of everything. And when bread became the symbol of the sacrifice of Christ, it had meaning. We are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17 is an admonition against defiling the temple of God. We eat too much meat. Now, I will say that after the study that I've done. We eat way too much meat. And we as a society are suffering because of it. And we are suffering the diseases that we suffer because of the amount of meat that we eat. Remember, at the time of Christ, 70% were these things. These salads, these grains, these, these bricks. And so more and more, our Western diet, the diet of, afflu uh, of affluence, is bringing the diseases of affluence. And so let's think about that. Certainly we have to think about the sacrifice that Christ made, the sacrifice of his body. We need to think about that and realize that we can't do this casually. We have to remember that he made that sacrifice for our healing, but we can't go about deliberately flaunting in the face and doing things that we can come to realize will make us sick and suffer these diseases. We have to discern the body of Christ. 